Alright everyone, welcome back. Episode 22 of Bando's Breakdowns. I'm Zam Bando. Thank you again for joining me on this fine Wednesday afternoon. I greatly appreciate it as I know many of you guys could be doing a ton of other things, but you decided to take 35 to 45 minutes out to listen to me. So before we even get into anything, I just want to say I appreciate you all who uh, make this a part of your weekly routine. Uh, it, it, it means a lot to me. Again, this is episode 22, courtesy of the Empty the Bench Podcast Network and presented by Playback. We have a lot of stuff to get to today. Again, it's going to be a consistent theme on this show moving forward, at least for the next month or so. Heavy on the college football stuff, heavy on the NFL stuff, heavy on the combat stuff, and so much more. So before we get into it, just wanted to give you guys a quick, um, a few quick reminders here. You go to youtube.com slash ETV Network. We are still on the climb. To a thousand subscribers, so it would be greatly appreciated if you like what you saw today. Please be sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. It helps out the algorithm a ton, and it allows me and all of the other uh, contributors on the network to keep doing more shows like this one as well. So thank you again for all of your support there. And my name is Amanda. You can follow the show across social media at the and um at the end just breakdowns. It would, it would be it would be greatly appreciated if you gave me a follow that, or as well that's scrolling across the bottom of the screen. You can find me on uh, Twitter, um, Twitter uh, slash X, Instagram, and TikTok. So again, that's very much appreciated. You can listen to the show wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube Premium, Acast, and so much more. Uh, wherever you get your podcasts, be sure to add it to your podcast feed. That way you don't miss a single episode uh, from me. Um, on a weekly basis, so that would be very much appreciated as well. And I just wanted to give also a quick, um, a quick um, shout out to our friends over at Playback as well. They've been a very, uh, they've been a very good partner to us, and they've started to give us a bunch of football. So I think we're all happy in that regard uh, from a national TV perspective. So without further ado, here we go. Presented by Playback, watching sports is more fun with others, but we spend too much of our time watching alone. Playback is a virtual space where communities can stream live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Readers can hop on stage, deliver their own play-by-play analysis and commentary, and invite viewers up for Q&A. Uh, Playback makes watching sports fully interactive in the social experience, from playing fantasy sports, repping your favorite players and teams, and watching with the commentators and communities you care about. Win or lose, sports are best enjoyed together. You can go and join our community right now. It takes about 30 seconds at playback.tv slash ETV Network to find out more, including our live stream schedule, which is more than likely going to be mostly heavy on Sunday Night Football. We just had a recent Sunday Night Football stream. I was also on it um, uh, as the Bears fell to the Texans. We're going to talk about that a little bit today, as well as the Bears' upcoming game in Indianapolis and so much more. So now we can get into the show. We're going to jump right in. To, uh, to Zan's overview, and we're going to briefly break down really quick before we get into what we're going to be talking about today. So some key storylines today. We're going to be recapping UFC 306. We're going to be previewing Anthony Joshua versus Daniel Dubois for the uh, for the vacant IBF heavyweight title. Uh, did a little bit of a longer preview on this. I'm one of the MMA Outsider Shorts that's coming out this week. For those of you looking for episode 99, that has been pushed back a week, so during the final week of the month of September, you will be able to catch uh, the 99th episode before episode 100 is chronicled by previewing UFC 307, so thank you for your patience on that. We're also going to be covering college football. We're into a new week. It's week four now, um, and one of my two alma maters is undefeated and ranked in the AP Top 25, so you'll be able to find out who that is, and, and of course, we're going to be going over a couple of other uh, news and notes items related to college football and just overall the world of sports in general. So uh, we're going to jump right into it first um, with Illinois being ranked in the AP Top 25. It's the first time since 2011 um, that Illinois will be ranked um, um, uh, going in this early in the season. It's the first time since September uh, of 2008 uh, that, uh, that Illinois uh, will We'll be ranked this early in the season. Um, <sighs> All right, let me just. Say. 
Mm. Yeah. Actually, let me just start with that over again. Okay, so Illinois is uh, is ranked for the first time uh, since 2011. They started 6-0 that year under then-head coach Ron Turner. Brett Bielema has done the same thing about 13 years later. Um, he's now 3-0, uh, first time in his Illinois tenure. He's in his fourth season. He has a huge rematch game against Matt Rule and the Nebraska Cornhuskers this Friday night in, in, in Lincoln. Uh, it's a Fox game. It's the brand new Fox College Football Friday Night Package. One of the key games that they're open that they're opening the slate with. I believe it's the second game on this new Friday Night schedule. So congratulations to everyone. Fox, they're getting marquee college football. So this is just just awesome, uh, awesome to see. And 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 truly, uh, you know, you know, this is what makes college football so exciting. You don't, you know, you don't really know. Uh, what to expect going into the season? You don't really know if these national TV games are going to play out, and I and 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 I think this is a tremendous test for for the Fighting Illini here. You're taking on a a program in Nebraska that's still in rebuild mode, still figuring out ways to win, but they have this freshman quarterback in Dylan Rayola that you know to me has been very impressive. He's kind of been the anchor of the offense. He's the one that's putting up all the yards and scoring them and scoring the majority of the points through the air, and it's just good to see that Illinois is finally taking on an offense that could give them some fits. Obviously, Illinois is one of the most underrated defenses in the country. Um, Xavier Scott is already having a breakout season with all of his turnovers. Luke Altmaier has yet to turn the ball over on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, Pat Bryan is turning into the player that everybody thought he would be coming out of high school a couple years ago. I mean, th- this this game should be an absolute dogfight. And to see Illinois be a um, an underdog on the road, you know, is not is not a surprise. Um, Illinois, you know, you know, will really will will probably need some lucky breaks. Uh, you know, you know, moving forward to try to, to try to win in this game, and I'm actually picking Illinois to win this game. I think they pull off the upset, get to four zero, and in, in this game, twenty four to twenty one. I think when you're a team that's still learning how to win games. When you're a team that's off to a hot start like Brett Bielema's team is, and when you're a veteran coach like Bielema, you know who 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 continued to you know maintain success at Wisconsin, and you know in 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 gate and and had moderate success at Arkansas, you have to win games like this. And if you can win a game in Lincoln, Nebraska, all those fans that you know maybe thought like, oh, maybe Illinois really isn't that relevant, they're looking up at a four and zero start going into a game. Most um, going into a game on a Saturday night against Penn State the following week, you know, staring at five and zero and potentially, you know, a colossal um, October to come with huge games on the horizon. So these next two games here can really define how this season is remembered. And I just think for these guys to have an opportunity to go into an environment that you know is is sold out house only, uh, if, uh, if you will, is 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 a big deal. So I'm picking Illinois here. To pull off the upset, um, they made me believers through the first three weeks, and they and they dominated Central Michigan, and they and they looked unbelievable in the Kansas upset. So, this is this is a massive this is a massive game for a U of I program that isn't you know really known for their football, hasn't been known for their football in quite some time. Uh, but you, you know, overall, uh, just an exciting time to to be to be an alumnus, and this is honestly great for the Big Ten. The Big Ten is expanded into 18 schools you know a lot of people thought that you know the you know uh, UCLA um and, and and Illinois and some of these other programs that maybe are marquee college football programs uh coming in uh would would, would struggle in Illinois Illinois and in in and Indiana more specifically are two of the teams that have really jumped out as the two biggest surprises in the conference thus far so just to keep in mind again, a uh, huge game Friday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central kickoff on Fox from Lincoln, Nebraska. That is one that you do not want to miss whatsoever. All right, we're going to move over to the NFL now. I watched this game on playback uh, with a bunch of us here at the network. The Bears lose to the Texans, and they look horrible doing it. Uh, the Bears are now 1-1. One and one. Um, You know, I think it's the sign of it's the sign of growing pains. This is a young team. They're playing a Houston team that you know a lot of people uh, think are going to go to the Super Bowl. 
or or have a pretty good chance to go to the Super Bowl by season's end. And, you know, this is one of those games where the Bears had to slip up and they lost to a better team, it's simply put. Uh, you can't have the mistakes the Bears had. The offensive line could not protect Cable Williams. Uh, the second half was a total drag, and I think the Bears lost their composure a little bit after keeping the game relatively close and then, uh, of course, g- giving the game away late on that on that interception. Um, you know, it's just it's 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 brutal. It's not a it's not a good look um, for, for the Bears to go into another you know AFC South opponent in Indianapolis this week at one and one. It felt like a downer of a loss. But I think this is going to be the uh, constant theme for the Bears. They're going to win a couple games and they'll lose a couple games. But the, but the constant theme with this team, given the schedule that they have, is I think they're going to be in a lot of close games. And that's exciting for a team that, you know, was, was you know, honestly not relevant in the, you know, in the last decade in terms of just being competitive. So for me, I'm taking this season as a learning experience. Do I want to see the Bears make the playoffs? Of course I do. Am I panicking at a one and one start? No, but I am looking at this, you know, from, from a realist perspective. And the fact of the matter is, is Cable Williams is a rookie quarterback. He's only going into his third game as a pro. It's going to take him a while to develop, and games like this are going to happen. So I just think it is what it is. And Houston uh, was the better team. All right, we're going to move into UFC 306 now. Uh, first thing I want to do before we get into the fights themselves is I just want to give kudos to the entire UFC production team. They killed it with the entire main card um, appearance with this thing. Uh, everybody thought, or, or most people that I saw online thought that the sphere was this overblown thing and it wasn't going to look good on TV. And uh, from from the beginning of the card, at least during the prelims, um, it, it didn't look good. But I think all their investment, that $20 plus million dollars that they spent, really went into making sure that the main card uh, was was worthy the, either people paying at home or paying an absurd amount of money uh, to go in person. Um, I thought it was really cool. Um, I thought the way they, you know, the way they chronicled the history of Mexican fighting, I thought was one of the most unique parts about it. And I also thought that overall, like just the way they told the fighters' stories and the way, you know, the fights lived inside these worlds, just like Dana promised us they would, I thought was one of the coolest parts about it as well. So I I really have nothing to say other than kudos to the production team. Uh, they killed this. It was unlike any other UFC that I've ever seen. Uh, this felt like their version of a World Cup or a Super Bowl of sorts, but a celebration of a country at the same time. So I just thought overall, if if, if you were if you are Mexican or even if you aren't, I, I'm not. I, I thought I thought the whole thing from a cultural standpoint was awesome. And, you know, even though the main and co-main event didn't fully deliver, and we talked about this more on the UFC 306 um, post-show on Sunday morning that went out um, uh, as, as part of the MMA Outsiders, you know, I, I thought, I thought um, even though he did lose, I thought that Sean O'Malley being in that spotlight, given the current state of the UFC and given where the sport is made the most sense. I think Alex Pereira would have not um would have not fit the bill just because he's Brazilian and even though he's really exciting and he blows the doors off places, I don't think it would have resonated with the people that well. Sean O'Malley was the perfect guy given the situation that they were in that they that they used uh to market this show. And even though he even though he lost, uh we have a new international champion and that is the second Georgian champion in UFC history, Marab Davalishvili. I uh, just wanted to address a couple of things from this fight. Personally, I didn't think the fight was very good. Uh, the fight did not live up to expectations at all. Uh, as Dana White alluded to at the post-fight press conference, Sean O'Malley looked flat. Um, he looked underwhelming, and he, you know, for various points of the fight, he just looked like he didn't want to be in there, whereas Marab basically did whatever he wanted to him, and then, of course, O'Malley did not pick up the pace until the final... Uh, probably two minutes of the fifth round, which is just something that if you're a champion, uh, you can't have happened. So now he's no longer the champion anymore. Uh, he addressed some things on his podcast, and unfortunately he had a concerning update that more than likely he would not be fighting for about a year, and the partial reason is because he tore his labor. So 
that's that's disappointing from an O'Malley perspective. Uh, everybody loves them. It's going to be hard to see how they're going to fill that void now. But um, Rob Devalish really versus Umar Nurmagomedov uh, should be a phenomenal fight. And uh, there's a good chance that given the Nurmagomedov legacy and name that we might have a new UFC Bantamweight champion once again, sooner rather than later, uh, depending on when the fight takes place. Also, shout out to Valentina Shevchenko. We can finally say that the Ultimate Fighter Season 32 is complete because the coach has fought. Valentina is the is the new UFC flyweight champion. It's the second time she's won the flyweight belt. So shout out to her for that. Uh, she's back to being the best flyweight on the planet. And uh, there's a sense of normalcy there, given that, you know, from like 2018 to 2023, she was one of the most dominant uh, flyweights in the world and arguably the greatest female flyweight of all time. Uh, Grasso will be back, obviously, but it's going to be hard to see, uh, you know, how many times she would need to win to get back to a title shot because that division is slowly but surely getting deeper. There's Tatiana Suarez out there. There's uh, Rujo out there. There's a lot of options out there uh, for what the uh, for what the flyweight division could look like. Um, and then there's also the super fight possibility with Wei Wei Zhang as well. Overall, I got to give this grade a B plus. I thought it was a good show. Uh, it would have tipped me over the edge, though, had the main event or co-main event delivered. But the sphere was the sphere. I'm glad I saw it. Um, it was it was a it was it was a good show, and I think it lived up to expectations as a concert slash fight mixed into one. So I thought it was really cool. Um, across the street, though, at the T-Mobile Arena, we had a Canelo master class. And uh, he fought um, a local kid out of New York, Edgar Berlanga, who was undefeated going into this fight. And I'm sorry, um, I've been a big boxing supporter this whole year. And in the last year, there's been some good fights in the world of boxing. This was not one of them. Edgar Berlanga did not look like he wanted to be in there with Canelo. Canelo did whatever he wanted, used his jab, used his right hand, uh, moved him up against the ropes plenty of times. Uh, dropped Berlanga in round three. I mean, in this fight was just a, a total whitewash. Um, Canelo needs to fight um, bigger competition now. He needs to be thinking about Terrence Crawford. He needs to be thinking about getting a fight with David Benavidez done, which would be the biggest fight at 168, probably since Floyd Mayweather um, w w was, was ruling that division several years ago. Canelo needs to start thinking bigger. He needs to put his ego aside, and he's got to make the fights that people really want to see because no one asked for Edgar Berlanga. Um, no, no one wanted to see Edgar Berlanga in there, and this is no disrespect to Edgar Berlanga, but 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 he was he was not ready for that fight by any stretch of the imagination, and uh, the PBC needed to do a better job from a matchmaking and mandatory perspective because. That fight did not deliver at all, even though the rumor is now out that the pay-per-view buys did really well. Full disclosure, I did pay for this one, and the broadcast was good, but the fight itself was just was not was not good. But I guess on a positive note, though, Canelo does still own Mexican Independence Day to a certain extent, which means he's going to do the annual thing, take a bunch of time off, fight on Cinco de Mayo, and go from there. So that'll be interesting to see where Canelo goes from there, Berlanga. Still a really young fighter, still in his like mid thirties, I'm pretty sure, mid to early thirties. So I, I I think he should be okay in terms of the longevity. This was too big of a step up in competition for him to fight the pound for pound best boxer in the world. But I think you live and you and you learn in that scenario. So shout out to Canelo there. Did not get the exact prediction right. I did predict a ninth round TKO in this fight, but Canelo was able to walk away with a decision win. So. No crazy upsets uh, in Vegas uh, this weekend at the very least. All right, speaking of combat sports, we're going to move on to the news that UFC 309, the main event, is done. It's official November 16th. We're trying this again. John Jones versus Stipe Miocic. I am so excited for this fight. I am absolutely one of the few people who still thinks that this fight needs to happen. So let me try to break this down in layman's terms. You've got the greatest fighter of all time taking on the greatest heavyweight fighter of all time, and they're finally facing off. Uh, John Jones uh, did an interview with it, with an outlet that I had never heard of before. 
This was just a couple days ago. Um, the name of the outlet is Clocked and Loaded, and he basically implied that regardless of how the fight plays out, this is going to be his last fight. So this is this is what I think about this whole situation. And I wrote a column about this for MMA Knockout. It was released uh, yesterday morning, so go, go check it out. I talk about why I believe that the biggest loser in this whole scenario was Tom Aspinall. So I'll try to break this down as best as I can. So I'm not going to get into a huge rant, but I am going to say this. Do I believe that John Jones is 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 the greatest fighter of all time, hands down? Yeah, as I do. In in in, in mixed martial arts, one hundred percent. There's no debate. I think he's done everything he's needed to do to prove that. But in terms of the greatest fighter in the UFC right now, no way. He's fought once in four years. He was injured going into the first Steve Amiocic booking, and. It took him three and a half years to bulk up to heavyweight. And the guy who he beat, Cyril Gan, was not the best heavyweight in the world. This was a narrative that the UFC was trying to push because Francis Ngannou was no longer with the organization. So I think it's a bit overblown for Dana White to say that the, the, the best fighter right now is John Jones. But in terms of pound for pound, go 100%. Okay. Now, Another issue with this fight is Stipe Miocic, who is the former UFC heavyweight champion, has not had a win in MMA since August of 2020. His last win was against Daniel Cormier. His last MMA fight was against Francis Ngana, where he lost the heavyweight title. So he's earning a heavyweight title fight off of a loss to a guy that's no longer in the promotion. And all of the other fighters that, that he's beat to this point uh, are no longer in the promotions. So that, that that tells you that tells you all you need to know. This this fight is on a is on a uh, this fight feels like in 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 respect. This fight almost feels like Floyd Mayweather versus Manny Pacquiao happen, happening five years too late. Because if you remember in 2015, both of those guys when they fought were past their prime. They were they were neither of them were the same fighter. And the fight was boring. I expect very, very similar vibes to this fight if this fight actually goes off without a hitch. The biggest loser in this scenario, though, was Tom Aspinall. You're talking about a young, up-and-coming heavyweight that's knocking everybody out. You're talking about a guy that won the interim heavyweight title last November, was forced to defend the title because of this whole mess and because of the UFC's desire to make sure that this fight happened. So he had to go in and defend it, and he had to win that fight in order to equally prove himself. And now, we're in a scenario where if Jones retires and if Stipe retires, Tom Aspinall could just get elevated to undisputed champion and not even have to worry about winning the, the literal belt himself. So I think the biggest loser in this whole thing is Tom Aspinall because usually in the UFC, it is commonplace for an interim champion to fight the undisputed champion for them to unify the belt. The UFC, it seems, does not want to go in this direction, and they're banking on the fact that if Jones wins, Jones will fight Aspinall. That's what Dana believes, but according to Jones's recent comments, it looks like that won't happen. So the UFC has put themselves in a corner because this fight has not gotten done when it needed to get done, and uh, Jones getting injured made the situation even worse. They better have Tom Aspinall on standby as a backup in case this fight falls through. Once again, I'm going out on a limb and saying this fight will happen. Um, and obviously it didn't happen a year ago, but I have faith that this fight will happen. Although there is the there is the uh there is the uncomfortable feeling knowing that if this fight uh does not take place, UFC 309 is gonna be remembered as the main event that could have been. So my early pick is John Jones. I'm assuming nothing catastrophic happens. Would I like to see Steve Bay win as someone from the Midwest? Absolutely. He's a Cleveland, Ohio a native. I'm from Chicago. I'd love to see Steve Bay win, but I think him being 40 plus years old, having not fought in a long time, coming off of a loss, uh, does not have the same stamina and energy he once did. Has a great legacy, but again, the, the biggest knock on him is um, he has not fought anyone that's on the current UFC roster at the moment. And, uh, 
that's something that I don't know if you'll ever see a scenario like that ever again. We're, we're getting a guy in a title fight uh, that has the resume he does, but hasn't fought anyone that's that's currently in the promotion. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. Uh, but I am picking Jones uh, to win that fight. Uh, just briefly, Bears and Colts now uh, trying to just move this along as, as, uh, as efficiently as I can. Uh, I like the Bears here. I think the Colts have too many inconsistencies. Anthony Richardson is a good quarterback. Uh, the, you know, they, they played a beatable Packers team uh, about uh, less than a week ago, and their defense just didn't make enough plays at the end of the game. I think if the Bears keep it close and it's low scoring, um, I think the Bears can win this game. So here's a little teaser. I, I, I'm, I'm taking the Bears. Uh, to win the game and cover the spread outright, I think it's going to be something like twenty three, probably twenty three seventeen. I'm wondering there. I see, I see a low scoring game. I see the Bears defense forcing a couple turnovers, and uh, you know, I even though I think Lucas Royal Stadium is a loud environment, it's a tough environment to play in. I almost think it's almost a, a miniature home game for the Bears because they don't have to travel that far, and they know there's going to be a lot of Chicago fans uh, in attendance. Uh, for that one, I'm not going to be one of them. I will be um, in Chicago at a local establishment watching this while celebrating my birthday. So hopefully there's not going to be too many angry Bears fans on Sunday afternoon. But this is a game that I think the Bears can win before they come home and they play the Rams uh, to close out the month of September. So we'll see how the game goes. But I do think that the Bears are catching the Colts at the right time just because so far, the first two weeks, you don't know what Colts team you're going to get, and you could very much make the argument that the Colts, like the Bears, should be one and one instead of zero and two. So, it's uh, just something to keep in mind there. Anthony Joshua versus Daniel Dubois from Wembley Stadium, IBF heavyweight title. Uh, plain and simple, this is Joshua's fight to lose. If he wins this fight, he has options. He could wait for the winner of Fury Usyk. He could take another fight. Um, he could do whatever he wants. Daniel Dubois is the one that has nothing to lose. He's fought all the best heavyweights in the world. This is another big step up in competition. Uh, it's going to be primarily Joshua fans because it's in England, I would assume. Uh, but this should be a good fight. I like Joshua to win this fight late. Uh, I, I discuss it in another short on, uh, on, um, on, uh, this week's batch on the MMA Outsiders, if you will. But I like Joshua here. If he can keep it on the outside, be the counter striker that he is, he can knock out Daniel Dubois. If Daniel Dubois makes this thing ugly, gets inside, gets against the ropes, makes it interesting, he could take Joshua the distance. But I, I just think Joshua is the better fighter. The way he knocked out Francis Ngannou was very impressive. Dubois is coming off of a win against Philip Ergovic. So this should be an interesting fight. I think it does deliver. Um, it's on multiple platforms, pvv.com, DAZN, uh, Satellite, and so much more. Card begins a little bit earlier at 10 a.m. I think the main card is a few hours after that. So expect Joshua Dubois to enter the ring probably around 3.34 Eastern, somewhere in there on Saturday, September 21st. But my pick there is Anthony Joshua. All right. Um, we're going to move. Move now uh, from this over to my 25th birthday uh, sports wish list. So as you guys know, I turned 25 on Friday, September 20th. It's the same day that Illinois plays Nebraska. And I have a couple of things on my wish list that I'd like to see before the end of 2024. I would love to see Illinois make a bowl game uh, if they can win on uh, if they can win on Saturday. Or excuse me, I think it went on Friday. They will be two wins away from securing their first bowl berth in two seasons. So I'd like to see that happen. Uh, I would like to see the Bears win a minimum of eight games just to know that they're on the right trajectory toward a playoff berth. <sighs> I would like to see over the next year, I'd like to see at least one of the two Chicago baseball teams make the playoffs. I don't care which one it is, although I am a Cubs fan, so I guess I could say I'd like to side with them. So I'd, I'd like to see that. Um, and also, final thing on my wish list is if Michigan makes the college football playoff, I hope they lose in, I hope they lose in the second round. I hope. Well, they either lose in the in the, in the second round at a neutral site or the or in the first round at home. 
against whoever they play because that would just be hilarious. So that's my brief 25th birthday sports wish list. It's not really too incent too specific. I just want to I, I just want to be able to root for certain teams to lose and hopefully some of my predictions there will come true. Looking over to the zinger now. Um, I would say uh, just briefly, you know, again, another shout out to the to the UFC production team here. I think the uh, I think the 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 production was amazing. Uh, I captivated your imagination. Uh, I kept you in your toes. It kept you watching the show. I thought overall it was a good show. Uh, j- just just holistically, it was it was a good main card. The issue that I had though was you look at the runtime of the show. And it was about four hours and fifty-two minutes. UFC events should not be ending at two thirty a.m. Eastern. I'm just going to put it to you simply: a five-fight main card should not take six to, six and a half to seven hours, or, or excuse me, uh, five hours to produce an entire card. Shouldn't take eight hours to complete. Um, so, just something to keep in mind. They may not do the sphere again, but in terms of pacing, they got to do a better job. They needed less advertisements and. Uh, they couldn't have done without the power slap promo, in my opinion, in October. Promote it closer to the event. Uh, the rest of it, I guess, was justified, but still uh, could have sped it up. Too many, too many, too many walls in the action. Um, I don't know. I just think for those who were there, it was probably cool. But for those on TV, like myself, I think the pacing was a total drag. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, another. Another thing I want to get into back into the college football world, it's been announced by several sources that uh, the former U.S. President of the United States, uh, Donald, or excuse me, former U.S. President Donald Trump will be attending Alabama versus Georgia. Obviously, this is a marquee game on the college football schedule. Uh, Two potential college football playoff contenders, uh, two potential national title contenders if they keep playing well. Uh, So I don't think this should be a surprise to anyone. Um, it's clear that Donald Trump likes other sports. He likes college football. He likes the UFC. Uh, he goes to Navy, Army Navy uh, pretty consistently. So I, uh, you know, I really, I really can't blame him. And he's been to the national championship between these two teams too. This was like five and a half to six years ago. So he's been to a lot of different sporting events um, in the past. And uh, you know, given the uh, given the status of these areas, given uh, just kind of, uh, just kind of what they believe in to beat around the bush a little bit. Uh, it should be, the, the, it should be no surprise that the college football's marquee uh, southeastern conference game of the week is uh, is getting the is getting the VIP treatment from somebody pretty famous. So, just another reason for America to watch uh, Alabama versus Georgia, regardless of what your feelings are on Trump. Hopefully, the game. Uh, lives up to the hype, and hopefully over 20 million people watch it. I hope it's a banner night of we're all involved at ABC, ESPN, and just the college football world uh, at, uh, at large, because I think that game is going to over-deliver. And then some. my early pick there is an upset for Alabama over Georgia um, uh, for, for that one. So we'll see how that game plays out. Just as a heads up, uh, that game is currently scheduled. Let's see. Uh, that game is currently scheduled September 28th, as both of these teams are now idle uh, going into this weekend. Georgia dropped to number two in the country and is now behind number one Texas after an underwhelming performance against the Kentucky Wildcats uh, this past weekend. So, just something to keep in mind there. And then finally, because um, I, I have to talk about this, Deion Sanders. Uh, public enemy, public enemy number one, two, three, four, all the way up to a thousand. I think his team is uh, his team is a dumpster fire. They're winning games, but they're winning games in the ugliest way possible. You got your starting quarterback coming up to the opposing team and saying, "Keep the same energy that you did on Instagram." Like, dude, you got it. You got to you got you got to let some of this stuff go. I mean, you got first into beef with. Excuse me. First, it's a beef with reporters. Second, it's getting getting uh, just obliterated in handshake lines. Third, it's stupid play calls when you're up at the end of the game. He needs to really look in the mirror and figure out, you know, what he wants his identity of this program to be. 
Because to me, it seems like more of a circus than an actual football team. So I don't think I need to get any more into that than that. And you want to do your own research, you can look it up for yourself. But this guy's not the guy that if I was in charge of Colorado, this is the guy I would not want leading my program, especially for a program that had a storied history several years ago. And I think it's just going backwards and not forwards, even though they are uh even though they are winning games to some extent, it's not the expectations that Colorado fans had originally when he was first hired uh, a couple of years ago now. All right, now we're going to move into Zan's look ahead. Uh, the NFL Week 3 or Week 4, it should be Week 3, so wait, yeah. Week 3, sorry, Week 3, Week 4 in college football, Week 3 in the pros. Um, It's a pretty decent slate this week. Uh, Just to give you a little bit of a, a brief recap on how I did predictions-wise, uh, straight up, I went 500 against the spread. Uh, not as great. I uh, don't really want to talk about it. It's one of my worst against the spread records um, of my career. Uh, let me just say this. It was far below 500. And in terms of NFL Survivor, uh, we did okay this week. We're still in one Survivor pool. There's one Survivor pool remaining that I have. Um, I'll reveal my pick for that on the newest edition of Bando's Blitz that will come out later this week. Uh, but for those of you who are in Survivor who tailed at least one of my picks, that was the Kansas City Chiefs a week ago, thanks to a game-winning field goal, you are still alive in Survivor. So shout out to you if you had the Chiefs. Uh, all right, going into the NFL Week 3 slate, we're going to go over who is playing uh, this week. So starting with the Thursday night game, it's going to be the Patriots versus the Jets on the Amazon Prime. Uh, the Eagles, who who had a stunning loss to the Atlanta Falcons at the time that we're recording this. This is on Tuesday. That was last night on Monday Night Football. Denver and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, in Tampa. The Giants and the Browns. Houston and Minnesota. That game already looks like a pretty decent matchup, considering that Sam Darnold uh, is, is, is playing really well in the absence of J.J. McCarthy. Green Bay versus Tennessee in a must-win game for the Titans. Uh, the Bears, the Colts, which we went over. Chargers and the surprisingly undefeated Pittsburgh Steelers in Pittsburgh. The Dolphins in Seattle. The Panthers who are in free fall against the Raiders who are on cloud nine after upsetting the Ravens. We're now 0-2. The 49ers playing the Rams. Detroit going to Arizona in a game that might end up being a trap game for Detroit. That's a game that they could lose. Something to keep in mind, there was a game to potentially stay away from if you were in Survivor. Um, the Ravens were 0-2. They played Dallas. Uh, let's see. And then we got the Chiefs and the Falcons and a double Monday night. Um, a double Monday night uh, batch, if you will. Jacksonville, Buffalo, and the Commanders and the Bengals. So that is the Week 3 slate. Uh, you'll get my Survivor picks later this week. You'll get my picks on football forecast later this week as well. So all the NFL you need covered, uh, I have you covered there as well. Wanting to go back over to the college football side of things in week four, just to give you the top 25 matchups this week to pay attention to, because there are a couple of them. It's a little bit more, uh, it's a little bit more of a, um, it's a little bit more of a better slate this week, if you will. Taking a look at some ranked matchups, we got, Illinois versus Nebraska, as I said. Number 21, Clemson hosting NC State. Ohio State hosting Marshall. Uh, Louisville hosting Georgia Tech. Uh, Notre Dame, who dominated uh, Purdue a week ago, 66-7, is hosting Miami of Ohio, and they're now number 17 in the country. Northern Illinois against Buffalo. Utah versus Oklahoma State. Uh, USC versus Michigan, that's going to be an elite game on CBS. Uh, that's at 3.30 Eastern. Missouri, who survived uh, who uh, survived against uh, Boston College in a pretty, uh, in a pretty wild, uh, wild win there. Tennessee versus Oklahoma in the nightcap game. And uh, if you're curious, number one Texas is a massive favorite at home against Louisiana Monroe. So that is the college football slate for this week. Some of the games to look forward to, but again, um, again, the big game to look out for, because I'm a little biased, is the ranked matchup Friday night between Illinois and Nebraska. 
because the winner of that game could have a fast track to potentially between six and eight win season given who they have remaining on their schedule. That is going to do it for another edition of Bando's Breakdowns, though. This has been episode 22. My name is Dan Bando. Thank you very much for tuning in. Once again, I greatly appreciate it. Just a quick reminder, this has been a presentation of the Empty the Bench Podcast Network presented by Playback. And finally, once more, you can listen to Bando's Breakdowns for every other podcast, whether that's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube Premium, and so much more. And until then, I will see you all for episode 23 next week, where I will be officially 25. And we will talk about um, all the all the news and notes in the world of sports through the end of September and into October. It should be an absolute blast. And thank you again for tuning in. It is very much appreciated. Until next week, have a great rest of your week. Enjoy all the college football. Enjoy the off weekend of no UFC, but enjoy all the boxing and so much more. So until then, I will see you guys soon. And have a great rest of your day. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,